like to um, acknowledge the previous talk as a really uh, outstanding background for and now about half of my uh, background slides will be obsolete, um, which will make it go a lot faster. Um, the one uh, significant difference, I think, is that uh, the work that I'll talk about um, is entirely in mouse, so disregard, uh, disregard any of the um, human references to the background and everything else is the same. Um, in my lab, uh, we've been interested for um, a number of years in understanding how antigen presentation occurs in both helpful and um, autoimmune immune responses. Um, and uh, in particular, the role of transcription factors in driving T cells and antigen presenting cells towards a phenotype that generates um, autoimmune diseases. So um, again, uh, pretty much this will uh, this will be redundant um, background, but just to orient you towards um, what we what I'll talk about um, in thinking about the kind of requirements for an autoimmune response. Um, what we uh, think about um, in terms of targets and how these autoimmune responses. Uh, antigen presenting cells have to take up antigen, um, become activated, and activate T and or B cells um, of a CD4 and or CD8 uh, nature for the T cells. Um, and then uh, those T cells go on to destroy, uh, um, in the case of MS um, and EAE myelin. What we're interested in um, in, this, in this particular portion of um, my lab is how uh, T cells, in however you want to divide them, um, turn into the T cell phenotypes that, um, that create these harmful autoimmune responses. So transcription factors in particular are, um, are the uh, are driving factors for um, polarizing naive T cells towards Th1, Th2, Th17, Tregs, and there are many subsets which um, were very nicely outlined in the previous talk. Um, so one one of the um, things that um, my lab has been working on is a transcription factor called um, Krupa-like factor four or KLF4, uh, which belongs to a family of zinc finger transcription factors. Um, it's probably better known for its role in maintaining uh, stem cell function. Uh, there were studies shown that KLF4 is one of the um, transcription factors that when put into mature fibroblasts uh, confers an embryonic uh, pluripotent stem cell phenotype. Um, what we got interested in this factor um, for with some results that came out of uh, Kurt Sivens' lab, um, who at the time was my next door neighbor, uh, and John Alder, his graduate student, um, who discovered that uh, the Kala 4 was required for the differentiation of this inflammatory monocyte um, cell phenotype, which they defined as a GR1 uh, CD115 positive um, cell. And uh, we kind of had started discussions about whether KLA4 would have a role in the um, autoimmune response based on the requirement for some of these um, monocyte type cells in the uh, differentiation of um, autoimmune responses, in particular EAE. So we first just sort of globally assessed whether KLA4 was required for the generation of EAE. And um, in, uh, in uh, inducing EAE, um, the mice are immunized with a myelin basic protein, which leads to activation of uh, T cells, destruction of myelin, um, and the, ac the activated T cells essentially traffic into the CNS, where they again meet up with uh, antigen presenting cells and destroy myelin. So what we're interested in is whether these um, CD115 GR1 inflammatory monocytes were um, potentially necessary for the destruction of myelin or whether they also played a role in um, activating T cells uh, within the CNS. Um, so what the results of the first to sort of global study uh, turned out is that the mice that were deficient in KLF4 were um, essentially resistant to the induction of EAE. Um, so we next asked why. In the process of the active immunization, the um, mice are immunized with an antigen, an adjuvant, and both dendritic cells, 
uh, are required in that they have to take up the antigen process that present it, and then activated T cells um, go on to cause disease. So we uh, first wanted to assess whether the absence of um, KLA4 in either the dendritic cells or in the T cells was necessary. So we first analyzed the phenotype of the immune um, systems in the KLA4 knockout and compared to wild type, thinking that perhaps there was some defect in the um, ability of T cells to activate or um, differentiate or uh, traffic to the CNS. And what we found was that um, it, both CD8 and CD4 positive T cells um, in the spleen that there was essentially no difference in the uh, T cell development, equivalent numbers of T cells um, de developed and were present. Um, but before and at, after immunization, looking at CD44, CD25, um, there was no real difference in the uh, T cells um, from the KLA4 deficient mice, indicating that um, KLA4 wasn't required for the development of T cells in the thymus or um, migration to the spleen development of the immune system. Uh, in contrast, what we found was that the number of CD11B positive cells uh, were significantly decreased in the KLA4 um, knockout mice in both the brains and uh, the spleens, this which was pretty uh, consistent with the notion of this being important for inflammatory monocytes. Um, so what we asked was what's the role of uh, KLA4 in the induction of active EAE in T cells, inflammatory monocytes, and, um, and dendritic cells. Similar to what was found in the resting state uh, after immunizing mice, um, we also observed that in the brain there was a decrease in the inflammatory monocytes. Um, after immunization, a number of these uh, sort of GR, uh, GR1 positive CD115 uh, positive cells migrated to the brain. Uh, in addition to um, the decrease in CD11 B cells, uh, we also observed a um, decrease in dendritic and NK cells in the brain after, um, and brain and spleen after immunization, but no difference in T cells. And this was true through both, again, in the number in the spleen, and also in the number of um, T cells of both CD8 and uh, CD4 that migrated um, to the brain. So at this point, we actually really had no idea what the difference was um, between the KLF4 um, knockout mice and the wild type in terms of why they had such this uh, such a broad resistance to EAE. And um, we were further puzzled when we um, discovered that KLA4 uh, deficient um, dendritic cells were just as effective at stimulating T cells if we took um, uh, in vitro, took out CD11 C cells from either wild type or knockout cells, um, put them in culture with 2D2 cells, added MOG. Um, they proliferated. Um, they uh, using um, either purified dendritic cells, using whole spleen, um, regardless of the uh, purity of the cells, there was no difference um, in terms of their ability to stimulate T cells. And when we looked at whether there was a difference in the ability of um, the uh, KLF4 deficient mice to develop into memory T cells, um, again, there was no difference, indicating that kind of long-term that they were able to maintain whatever memory phenotype that they had um, developed. So, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so, in order to look a little bit more carefully at whether um, there was something about the KLA4 uh, knockout mice that suppressed their ability to activate mod reactive T cells, um, we adoptively transferred um, the MOG reactive uh, 2D2, 2D2 um, transgenic T cells that are specific for um, the myelin oligoprotein, um, transferred 2D2 cells into either wild type or knockout mice, immunized the mice, and looked at the ability of the, of the um, wild type or knockout T cells to lead to <coughs> expansion of the um, transgenic T cells which uh, removes sort of the variable of that both the APCs and the T cells are um, were knocked out in the previous experiment. And um, after transferring the 2D2 
T cells immunizing and um, analyzing the number of 2D2 cells that became activated, migrated to the brain, there was still no difference um, in either the wild type or the knockout mice. Um, in addition, the uh, CD11B cells that we looked at in the brain had equivalent um, abilities to uh, take up antigen. We thought that it was possible that this d that um, cells were maybe uh, possibly deficient in their ability to phagocytose antigen, um, but essentially there was no uh, no difference um, in those. So the next question. Um, that we asked is how is it possible with all these um, with all these features being the same that these mice are still so um, so resistant to um, to uh, induction of EAE? So we next asked whether we could bypass the resistance by um, providing adoptively transferred uh, pre-activated T cells. So in this case, rather than asking the KLF4 knockout mice to take up and process um, and present antigen that we would um, utilize <coughs> pre-activated MOG reactive T cells um, to induce disease. And the, the schematic for essentially how this um, experiment um, occurred was donor wild type mice are immunized with MOG, which generates a large number of um, T cells that are specific for MOG. And then those cells are taken out, cultured with MOG, and injected into um, recipient mice, which were either wild type or KLA4 knockout, uh, and um, then we evaluated the onset and progression of disease. And using the adoptive transfer of wild type MOG reactive T cells, the KLA4 deficient mice were still resistant um, to the um, induction of EAE. So in the absence of um, activating, the need for activating uh, T cells kind of in place, some we um, wanted to next assess what cells were preventing um, the disease or whether there was a further activation that was required that wasn't taking place in the KLF4 knockout mice. So in order to um, assess what was happening from the adoptively transferred cells from that were a wild type of MOG reactive, versus the host cells that were either wild type or KLF4 deficient, we uh, utilize a chimeric model in which we immunize the uh, we immunize the wild type mice for donor cells. Um, uh, they, we immunized uh, CD45.1 mice to generate CD45.1 MOG reactive T cells and then transferred those into CD45.2 wild type or CD45.2 um, KLA4 knockout so that we could assess what the difference was between the um, pre-activated adoptively transferred cells and the host. And then by fax, we were able to separate uh, CD4 by CD45.1. Um, so uh, the host being CD45.2 and the adoptively transferred pathogenic cells being CD45.1. And what we found was that the um, transferred CD45.1 uh, MOG reactive cells um, when transferred into wild type hosts made <coughs> um, gamma interferon IL-17 and, um, and when transferred into wild type hosts uh, the hosts also made gamma interferon in IL-17, um, but if we took wild type, um, wild type uh, MOG reactive CD45.1 cells and transferred them into KLA4 deficient T cells, while they made equivalent of, uh, amounts of gamma interferon, um, the host CD45.2 KLA4 deficient T cells. Um, made no IL-17 and, in fact, had a suppressive effect on the transferred in CD45.1 um, T cells in their ability to make IL-17. So essentially, the um, transfer of the MOG reactive wild type cells into wild type mice led to an activation of the host um, 
in the host CD4 cells to make both gamma interferon and IL-17 in kind of this uh, um, infectious process. And then, um, but when they're transferred into the wild type, the host T cells were unable to make IL-17, and in fact, there was less um, um, IL-17 in the transferred cells. So that was our first indication there was something really significantly different about the T cells that um, were deficient in KLF4. Um, and this, uh, this, these results are from the spleen. While we had a lot fewer cells, it also turned out that that was true in the brain as well, that um, in wild type, IL-17 producing T cells uh, traffic to the brain, whereas in the KLF4 deficient T cells, uh, uh, deficient hosts, they didn't. So um, the, we wanted to um, sort of set forth this as a hypothesis that there was the trafficking of these uh, KLF4 or the lack of the trafficking of the KLF4 deficient T cells into the brain um, that helped to protect the um, the uh, the CNS tissue from uh, the the damage done by the um, normal induction of EAE. So uh, we still um, weren't sure since the uh, there's a requirement of the host um, CD45 point two cells to actually activate the uh, T cells. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to ask whether there was something intrinsic to the T cells that um, KLA4 was required for the induction of um, IL-17 or whether at the, because the KLA4, the APCs, uh, dendritic cells, um, antigen presenting cells were also deficient in KLA4, whether the loss of KLA4 in the um, cells that drive the T cells towards TH17, whether those were, um, whether that also led to the inability of T cells to make um, IL-17. So we took out purified CD4 um, T cells and uh, naive uh, CD4 positive T cells and um, used artificial stimulation in vitro um, using anti-CD3, anti-CD28 stimulation with cytokines um, polarizing towards TH1, TH17, or Tregs, and compared the ability of the wild type um, CD4 T cells and the knockout CD4 T cells to polarize towards um, a gamma interferon secreting, IL-17 secreting, or FOXP3 expressing T cells. And again, what we found was that there was essentially no difference in um, polarizing towards uh, gamma interferon secreting cells or um, FOXP3 producing cells, but where um, wild type KLA4 T cells polarize very efficiently towards um, TH17, there's essentially no polarization towards TH17 in the KLA4 knockouts. So this led us to think that there was an um, intrinsic role for KLA4 within the T cells um, themselves that KLA4 might be required for the induction of IL-17. So <clears throat> while it um, was uh, required for polarization, one of the um, sort of interesting features was that there's no difference in um, CD4 T cell proliferation, and there was also no difference in, um, in the TH17 Treg axis. So there, the, there was no um, compensation for the loss of TH17. Essentially, these cells seem to stay in an, an undifferentiated, though um, proliferative phase, uh, state. Mm. So we next asked because of the sort of directness of um, the, or the requirement of KLF4 for IL-17 um, production, whether it, since uh, KLF4 is primarily um, a DNA binding transcription factor, whether it had a direct um, role for the um, regulation of IL-17, um, meaning was it required, um, did it bind to the IL-17 promoter and was it required for IL-17 expression. Um, so we used a, a chromatin immunoprecipitation assay to assess whether KLF4 um, actually bound to the IL-17 promoter, there are two binding site, two potential binding sites for KLF4 within the promoter, and um, using two different antibodies to immunoprecipitate KLF4, we found that um, KLF4 uh, did indeed bind to the IL-17 promoter. Um, we've uh, since actually gone on to 
conducted luciferase reporter assays um, and shown that it, uh, it not only binds, but it also activates. Um, so we, um, we started thinking about the role of KLF4 in this particular uh, um, differentiation of naive T cells towards the TH17 and the um, kind of canonical traps, transcription factor that's generally considered to be required for TH17 and um, mice ROR gamma T, and thought that perhaps there was an effect of, um, of KLF4 on the expression of ROR gamma T. But when we looked by um, uh, messenger RNA, there, comparing the induction of ROR gamma T in the process of polarizing naive T cells towards TH17, there's very um, significant upregulation of the expression of our gamma T in both wild type um, and the first and third bars and in um, knockouts as well. There's essentially no difference in the uh, level of messenger RNA for our gamma T. So <laughs> it looks as though KLF4 kind of acts um, either downstream or independently of our gamma T. Um, so although we found that, um, that it had this uh, intrinsic role within the TH17 cells and the requirement for the induction of IL-17, because we had seen um, a number of uh, possible differences in the sort of activation as well as the numbers of antigen-presenting cells, we next um, wanted to evaluate whether Kayla for in vivo function both at the level of the T cells themselves and also the number of um, antigen presenting cell factors that lead to T cell polarization. So um, in particular, <clears throat> um, IL-6 uh, and TGF-beta and also uh, GMCSF, which isn't necessarily thought of as a polarizing but a necessary for um, dendritic cell function. So <clears throat> the cytokine that is um, sort of particularly thought of in terms of um, polarizing and maintaining um, uh, uh, TH17 responses. Um, IL-6 was what we analyzed um, first, in particular uh, uh, getting back to the EAE studies where we found that the KLF4 mice were essentially resistant to EAE. And um, the IL-17 knockout mice, while uh, they have delayed progression and somewhat resistance, um, didn't have as significant a, a level of resistance. So in trying to explain why the mice um, were uh, pretty much entirely resistant to EAE, um, one of the clues uh, in the differences with the, it was with the differences in the antigen presenting cells and um, mice that are deficient in IL-6 are um, pretty resistant to EAE. So what we had found when we compared the um, levels of secretion of IL-6 from the KLF4 knockout and wild type um, dendritic cells is that the uh, DCs that were deficient in KLF4 were essentially secreted no IL-6. So they had <coughs> as great a um, deficiency in the secretion of IL-6 as they did, as the T cells did in IL-17. Um, and again, uh, we wanted to look at whether this was a direct function of the transcription factor um, function of KLF4. So we uh, analyzed whether the um, KLF4 um, bound directly to the IL-6 promoter again by the chromatin immunoprecipitation, and it indeed does bind directly to the IL-6 promoter, um, indicating that it has uh, a dual sort of um, regulatory function on both the secretion of IL-6 and IL-17. And I'll just go through the last uh, couple slides um, quickly because I think I'm out of time. But the, um, to uh, make a long story short, it uh, has no effect on IL-23 and um, no effect on GMCSF at, at where it does um, it has not nearly a significant effect on the secretion of TGF-beta but the cells that are deficient in KLF4 had about a 50% reduction in their um, secretion of TGF-beta. So <clears throat> our ongoing hypothesis is that um, KLF4 acts as a molecular switch that um, is necessary to generate the auto autoimmune um, and or inflammatory responses. Um, it doesn't have uh, any, any noticeable regulatory effect on T cells in a homeostatic 
um, state, but uh, it does regulate the uh, generation of um, of uh, macrophages of this GR1 CD, uh, CD115 high. And um, primarily where uh, what we um, what we are working on with this hypothesis is that the um, activity of KLF4 and the binding of KLF4 into the um, onto the promoters of some of these critical uh, cytokines in both dendritic cells and T cells helps to uh, helps to provide this coordinated regulation of both the dendritic cell and the T cell side of um, the generation of this um, autoimmune response. And um, I meant to acknowledge people as I went along, but uh, uh, Lori Lebson, um, Jason Rosenzweig, and Ann Goki are kind of the primary um, people who have uh, conducted essentially all of the um, experiments that I showed you, and John Alder and Kurt Sivan, who have, um, have been uh, ongoing collaborators since their discovery of um, the lack of inflammatory monocytes in KLF4, and um, Peter Calabresi and Lab for their um, expertise in EAE and MS, and Jonathan Powell and Chris Gamper, who primarily um, got us uh, uh, oriented towards the um, in vitro polarization of T cell process. Um, and I'll stop there. The question was, is there a consensus sequence um, for IL-6 and IL-17? And um, the answer is yes, there is. And interesting, there is, interestingly, there is not one in IL-23, and we don't see any difference there. So we think that the um, that's that it does need to bind um, to its consensus sequence. Although one of the questions is whether it, it acts as part of a um, kind of uh, complex that does it that may use altered sequences. Any questions? Thank you very much for hearing this.